Dear saints in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If you could invite any three people to join you for dinner, who would you invite? I know it's been a few years since many of us have been in the habit of inviting people over for dinner, and maybe you were never someone who is in the particular habit of inviting people over to your house for dinner, but just imagine for a second that you were, in fact, going to invite some people over to your house for dinner, and that you could invite anyone, literally anyone, anyone living or dead, people you've met or never met, people who are fictional or people who are real, imagine you could invite anyone, any three people over to your house for dinner, who would your three ideal dinner guests be? Well, you think about that for a minute or two and come up with your list. Let me tell you about who I would invite for dinner if I could. I spent a little bit of time thinking about this this past week, and I quickly realized it's not easy to come up with just three. When I was younger, like 10 years old or something like that, it would have been much easier. When I was 10 years old, I probably would have invited Wayne Gretzky over for dinner, my favorite hockey player, and I would have tried to convince him to come back and play for the Oilers one more time. I probably would have invited Batman over for dinner, my favorite superhero, the Adam West Batman in particular, and probably my grandpa, one of my favorite people. That's who it would have been. Wayne Gretzky, Batman, and Grandpa. I have no idea if they would have gotten along, but that's who probably would have been invited. But that was way back when I was 10 years old. Now, it's not so easy. Like I said, I tried to think about it a little bit this week, and I think I'd probably still want to invite Grandpa over for dinner, but Wayne Gretzky, yeah, he'd still be an interesting guy to meet, but there's a lot of other athletes, famous people, musicians, like people like that that I'd maybe want to invite instead of him. I've kind of outgrown Batman, Less interested in having him there, but there's a bunch of other fictional characters that I probably would be interested in getting to know. And then I realized that I should probably actually invite my wife, too, and then all the, everything got kind of thrown up in the air. Coming up with three isn't easy. But what about you? Who would you invite over for dinner if you could? Who would your three people be? I obviously don't know who each of you would invite over for dinner. And we'd probably be here for a while if I gave you each the opportunity to come up here and share who your list is, who's on your list, and why they're on the list. But <clears throat> I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb here and make an assumption about your list of three people. I'd be willing to bet that almost all of the people that you have included on your list, the people that you would like to invite over to dinner if you possibly could, all of them, I'd be willing to bet, are on your list because you think that you, personally, would enjoy having dinner with them. That you, personally, would enjoy talking with them, getting to know them, and spending time with them. They're probably all people that you like or admire, or something like that. Am I right about that? Some nods? Yeah, I thought so. Now, that really isn't a big surprise, is it? it? It really isn't a big surprise. This whole exercise, asking you to think about who you would invite over for dinner if you could, it lends, it lends itself to those kinds of answers. You telling me who you would like to have dinner with. And the reality is that when we do actually invite people over for dinner, those are the kinds of people we tend to invite. We invite the people we admire, the people we like, the people that we enjoy spending time with. And if you think back to my list of you know, Wayne Gretzky, Batman, and my grandpa, that's pretty much what I did too. But as we turn our attention to our gospel reading today, this fact that if we were to invite anybody over for dinner, we'd probably invite people we like and admire and enjoy spending time with. This fact should cause us to stop and think for a few minutes as we listen to what Jesus says about inviting people over for dinner. In our gospel reading today, Jesus himself has been invited by someone over for dinner. 
He's on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus is, and one of the rulers of the Pharisees has invited him over. This dinner party, however, is not some nice little imaginary dinner party where everyone's getting along and everything is going fine, and Jesus is not the ideal kind of dinner guest for this ruler of the Pharisees. Instead, what's going on here is more like a trap. This ruler of the Pharisees and his fellow Pharisees have invited Jesus over to dinner and they're watching him closely, and all of a sudden in trot some guy who has dropsy, the disease we now call edema, where joints and things swell up. And they watch to see what Jesus is going to do. Is he going to heal this guy on the Sabbath? The Pharisees, the ruler of the Pharisees and the rest of the Pharisees, they're just looking to build their case against Jesus. And what Jesus does during this meal, healing the guy who has dropsy, is going to become part of their case against him when Jesus ultimately does make it to Jerusalem and this ruler of the Pharisees is there with all the other rules of rulers of the Pharisees to condemn Jesus to death. But in the midst of all of this, this trap that's going on there at the dinner table, Jesus says something rather remarkable. At the end of our reading today, he looks at the man who's hosting this little get-together, this ruler of the Pharisees who has invited him over for dinner, and he says, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Like I said, Jesus' words here, I think, are really quite remarkable. I'm pretty sure that none of us, when we were coming up with our list of ideal dinner guests, included the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind in our lists. Not only that, but most of us have probably never even considered inviting those kinds of people over for dinner. Doing that kind of thing just isn't on the radar for most of us. These words from Jesus about inviting people over to dinner really extend well beyond questions about who's on the list for inviting. These words from Jesus are really like a mirror. A mirror that's held up in front of our faces to show us something about ourselves. A mirror that shows us the true nature of our own sinful condition. Jesus' words show us here that in our sinful condition, we are helplessly turned in on ourselves. Our inclination according to our own sinful nature, is always to think about what we as individuals might personally enjoy the most or about what we as individuals might benefit from the most. We're turned in on ourselves. That's why, for example, when we think about inviting people over for dinner, we tend to focus on the people that we like and enjoy spending time with. That's why something like what Jesus is suggesting here, inviting over the poor, crippled, lame, and blind, inviting them over for dinner, isn't necessarily on the radar for most of us. In our fallen, sinful condition, we are focused, or we tend to be focused inwardly on ourselves. Now that inward focus may seem natural. And some people would argue that, oh, we need to think that way because we can't take care of others unless we take care of ourselves first. And there's some truth to that, too. But Jesus is teaching us something a little different here. Jesus is teaching us here that our concern shouldn't be, first and foremost, about what we will enjoy the most are about what we will benefit from the most. Instead, Jesus says, our concern should be, first and foremost, about our neighbor and his or her needs. When you give a dinner or a banquet, Jesus says, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, 
lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed, because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now, if that all sounds a little extreme and a little strange, which admittedly it does, just think about the kinds of people whom Jesus invites for dinner. In our gospel reading today, Jesus himself has been invited over for dinner, but there's plenty of other readings in the gospels where Jesus invites people over to dinner himself. What kinds of people does Jesus invite over for dinner? Tax collectors. Sinners. This is what causes the whole ruckus with the Pharisees. This is why the Pharisees want to spring a trap and try and get them. Because they don't like the kind of people that Jesus hangs out with. Jesus eats dinner with tax collectors and sinners. And this morning, Jesus is going to do the very same. This morning, we're celebrating Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper. And Jesus himself invites us, you and me, to come and to eat with him at his table. What kind of guests are we, though? Are we the ideal dinner guests? Are we the kinds of people whom Jesus should want to have at his table? Far from it. We're blind. Spiritually blind, blinded by our own selfishness and our inability to see beyond what we want. We're the crippled ones. We're the lame ones, limping along in our sinful condition, unable to live up to the demands of God's holy law that commands us, not suggests, but commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves. We're the poor ones, spiritually poor ones, completely unable to ever repay Jesus for the wondrous gift of divine love and mercy that he gives us here with his own body and blood. We are poor, crippled, lame, and blind. And yet Jesus, out of his great love that is never turned in on itself, but is always turned outwards towards you, Jesus invites us to come to his table, to eat with him. And he invites you even you, poor, crippled, lame, and blind as you are, to come to his table to feast on his body and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. You are the kind of people that Jesus invites over for dinner. But that's not all. Because the meal we have here, the Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper that we celebrate here, it's really just the beginning. This meal here at this table is just the foretaste, just the preview, just the beginning of an even greater meal yet to come. Another meal to which you are also invited. The marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which will have no end. Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, he invites you to come eat this meal with him today, here and now, so that you can get a taste for that meal that is yet to come. That meal that he has prepared for you eternity. That meal in eternity. That meal that will begin on the last day when he stands again upon this earth and raises your bodies from the dead and invites you to come and sit at his table literally and join in the feast with him. Jesus invites you to this meal and to that meal because of his love for you. So let's come back to that question that we started out with here this morning. If you could invite anyone, literally anyone, to join you for dinner, who would you invite? If your answer to that question hasn't changed as you thought about Jesus' words here this morning, that's okay. It's not wrong for you to want to have dinner with your family or friends or people that you care about. Jesus himself did that too. There's lots of other stories about Jesus eating meals with his friends. He's not saying you can never do that. And if you aren't planning to go home today and turn your dining room into a soup kitchen or something like that and invite over all the poor, lame, and blind people you can find, that's okay too. It'd be amazing, absolutely amazing, if we could all manage to do something like that, but that's not all in the cards for most of us. 
Maybe, however, the next time you're thinking about inviting someone over for dinner, especially now that COVID things are getting, maybe it seems like a little bit better and people are more comfortable doing this kind of thing, maybe the next time you think about inviting someone over for dinner, it could be someone who wouldn't make that top three list. Someone who wouldn't be on your list of ideal dinner guests. Someone maybe who's having a hard time with something. Someone who's struggling with something for some reason maybe you don't even know. Someone who just needs someone to talk to. Someone who just needs to know that there's somebody out there who cares. It could be one of those people. After all, each and every one of us, we've been invited by Jesus to his dinner, to his feast. Right here, right now, as we receive Holy Communion, and there in eternity when we join in that feast forever. Not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, because he has died and risen from the dead to give that feast, that meal, to us. And what better way could there be to share and to show his love than to extend that invitation that he has first extended to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.